I can't believe this is happening. I, I really can't. I, I was, ex- you know, you send an email, you expect a no, and you get a yes. And it's a testament to how great this man is and, and, and his business and professional acumen is. This is someone who is a movie mogul, $3.2 billion in sales. The top three grossing comedy specials of all time. Uh, you know, the Forbes magazine, like the king of comedy. He's also a husband. He's a family man. He's a businessman. Uh, there's really nothing that he can't do, and we're going to hear all about it right now. Please, a big, warm welcome to the stage, Mr. Kevin Hart. Hello, 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 hello. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, not, not the three biggest specials of all time. Uh, Eddie Murphy <laughs> is definitely number one. I'm, I have three of my specials in the list. Three in the top ten. Yes, three of them in the top ten. So I, I, don't, I fudged it. I'm nervous. No, you didn't do it, but I just don't want that to get out there. And they're like, he lying. <laughs> he lying. No. I'm excited to be here, though, man. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So listen. Did you sip my drink? No, I did not. You sure? I, I took the, uh, the tequila. Okay. That all was right. you. I'm just making sure. You. Okay. And I left it back there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... You know, I was just watching um, Letterman and Obama. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw that, that interview that they did. Yes. Over an hour, and Letterman did it with no notes. It's just incredible, you know, how two experts, two pros can do it. But since there's only one pro here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I read your book. It's phenomenal. Thank you, man. Fantastic. I appreciate it. It is a must read. It's not only funny, it's incredibly inspirational. It's kind of a blueprint for what I want to talk about today, which is the correlation of building a major personal brand, entertainment Mm -hmm. brand, and also building a a company brand, which is something you're also great at. Mm -hmm. So in the book, I don't know if you know, but Kevin was a sneaker salesman, and he was the best one. Of course he was, right? It's true. Very true. And (laughs) he made the transition from sneaker salesman to stand-up. Um, so what was the, the path, what was that transition like t- from Kev the Bastard mm-hmm. to Mr. Kevin Hart the Mogul? Um, well, it was, a, it, was a, it was a long one, you know, because in the beginning of the transition from sneaker salesman to comedian, it was me finding out about a world that I heard about, but I never knew how to get to. Mm. And when the advice of other coworkers led me to the direction of a comedy club, you know, I fell in love. I fell in love with the amateur nights. I fell in love with the spotlight. I fell in love with hearing laughter from, uh, from thoughts that I would conjure up, you know, on a late night and just throw down on some paper. And after winning, you know, said amount of amateur nights, I was like, you know what, this is it. This is what I want to do. I found my calling. I want to be a comedian. I don't want to do anything else. And I threw all eggs in that basket because I didn't want another option. I wanted to have to make this work and not be able to fall back on something else. And in doing that, you know, you run into the trials and tribulations of growth in comedy. And what I realized is that for a while I was being a version of myself. I was being a character. I wasn't being Kevin Hart, you know. When you say Little Kev the Bastard, that was my stage name back then. It was something that I created in my head that I thought would make people laugh. So I had to understand and realize that people weren't walking away from my shows knowing who I was. They had no understanding for the talent that they came to see. They couldn't tell you about my life, if I had parents, if I had kids, if I was in a relationship, where I was from. They couldn't tell you anything because I was just a person that was talking. So I understood that you need a definition within your performance. People should be able to understand and define who you are based on what you give. And that was the journey for me. It was giving enough for people to walk away and go, I like that guy. Mm -hmm. He's a real guy. I relate and understand that guy. And when I got to that space is when comedy opened up and it became so much bigger and so much easier. Not as if it's an easy craft because it's not. It became easier for me because the stories that I were pulling from were life experiences instead of falsified moments that I was trying to create. Once I just dug into my life, I was like, the, the sky is the limit because there's so much that I can talk about. It's like you said, it's, it's not so much the story, it's your reaction to it, which mm-hmm. is the funniest part because 
you're just a funny, funny person. And Thank you. You got a lot of that information from, uh, was it Toure? Yes, yeah. yes. And, one, uh, of my, and uh, one of my mentors yeah. uh, when I was coming up. Toure was really a guy to just help me start. Uh, Keith Robinson acted as more of a mentor. And that was the guy who, who gave me, like, the first piece of reality in a conversation when I got off stage. What he used to call you? Uh, stupid. That's right. Stupid. He used to call me stupid. He, he was older. He would call me little dummy and stupid. <laughs> and the reason why, I was in love with laughs. And you got to understand that sometimes laughter, it, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything. Sometimes the laughter, uh, it... it it can, it can give you the perception that what you're doing is right and great because you are getting an abundance of laughs. And that's what I was getting. You know, I was going on stage. You ever see a black guy fall and then look at a white guy fall? <laughs> you, see, you see the difference in that? And people would laugh. Oh, and I would do the impression. And I would say, how come, how come people eat peanuts like this? And some people eat it like that. And those were the jokes. And people would laugh but I wasn't saying shit. I wasn't talking about anything. He was the first one when I got off stage. He was like, stupid, nobody knows who you are. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? I was just killed. And he said, stand by the door and watch how many people walk by you on the way out. That's how he talks. And I did. I stood by the door and not a soul said anything to me on the way out because I was a blur within the funny of the night. They saw so many comedians. I was just another blur. He said, not one handshake, not one pat on the back, not one, I love what you said. He said, because nobody knows you, stupid. If you want to know comedy, come with me, and I'll show you what real comedy was. And this is like my second time meeting this guy when he was talking to me like this, which was, which was really insane. I don't know why I was letting it happen, but there was, something, <laughs> there was something about what he was saying that just sunk in that made sense. And I allowed it to, to really sink in. And this is a guy that out of nowhere... I just decided to follow to New York. I said, okay, I'll go with you. And that one day to New York turned into years of back and forth between he and I and my development into becoming a comedian and me understanding the definition of a comedian. Uh, and I didn't in my younger years. I, I had no idea what it meant. And when I got a crash course education in it, it humbled me, made me respect the craft even more and made me go do my research and study those that came before me that paved the way for me to be able to do what I'm doing so I can have a different level of appreciation for it. And it's not that you really have time, but I know you're very philanthropic at heart. How are you paying that forward, what you got from Toure, what you got from Keith? Like, are you, you know, mentoring? Like, who's on the come up under you? Well, I mean, when I was coming up, you know, I'm 39 now. I've been doing comedy since oh, I was you look 18. Great. Thank you, man. Cool. A lot of water, drinking a lot of water. Um, <laughs> I was 18 when I first started. So when I first started, the opportunities that were given were very few, far, and in between. You know, you had to be in a circuit. You had to be a part of a crowd. You had to cross over into that mainstream world. And it was a, it was a tug of war. Like, you really had to pop to get the opportunities. And once I got to a place of success, I said, I can put myself in a position to create opportunities for others because the financial success gives you the opportunity to go and do what others don't think you can. So the umbrella of, of the Plastic Cup Boys that we created are uh, three comedians that have been on a roll with me, you know, since I started touring and since the touring went from comedy clubs to theaters to arenas to stadiums. You know, we've kept this tight-knit group together. And I went and I did a special for them. I went back, I did a special for Keith Robinson. Um, I went and I shot a special for a comedian named Little Rel. I was finding ways to take my money and invest it back into the craft and make an imprint to show I want to help funny. I want to help those that want to be funny and want a career in funny. I want to be a gateway to your newfound success. And the idea came up with me and a, and a business partner of mine, Jeff Clanigan, um, to create a platform, a network, uh, where we could give these opportunities to the next generation of funny um, through, a viral, through a viral platform, you know, a digital, not viral, a digital platform. And he said, what's your reason for doing it? And I said, I want to do it because there's an authentic purpose behind it. I want to 
go and show people that regardless of a level of success, it's more fun when other people get there too. Exactly. I don't want to be selfish with my knowledge or with my level. I want to give. And that's male, female, that's improv group, that's comedian, that's mm -hmm. comedic director, writer, whatever you are, I know how hard the road is to an opportunity. If I can be responsible for creating some and pop the next star or the next big thing or put a person in position to create and self-produce, then I'm doing my service for our generation. I'm now separating myself from a pact that was before me by giving myself a different purpose. So when you look at the career of Kevin Hart, the actor, the comedian will have several achievements, but if I do it correctly, the business and the creativity that went behind evolving these entities will catch up to the superstar and other superstars will be born that I'll be able to say, dude, I'm so happy. Ma'am, I'm so happy. That's the newfound interest. That's the newfound love. That's the goal. The goal is to have a bigger effect. Now when that's happened, and I can say I did that, now it goes into doing something else. It goes into to more humanitarian work and, and crossing over. Like what I'm finding is that what makes me happy is seeing others happy. And the one thing that I think our world is in desperate need of is opportunity. You know, so many people lack the opportunity. So many people lack the knowledge of how to get the opportunity. So more people that have it, I feel if we shared it, then we're all doing our service and making this a better place. My boy Bonnet would say, send the elevator back down. Right? That's a, very true. Yeah, shout very out true. to Bonnet, he's out there. I, I'm, a firm, I'm a firm believer in that. And I think, you know, it's not that uh, it was necessarily sent back down for me, but I was given so much information. You know, Chris Rock, Steve, Steve Harvey, you know, uh, I can go to D.L. Hughley at times. I can go to Cedric the Entertainer, uh, Dave Chappelle, Jerry Seinfeld. You know, I can go to people that were active in my, in my young career of just talking to me. Patrice O'Neill, Colin Quinn, Rich Voss. These were all, quote unquote, polished veterans in a comedian game. And there's so much that you don't know. You can walk into a door and not know what's behind it, or people can give you an idea of what to look forward to. Uh, I'm taking that and instilling that back in a unique way that fits me and fits my goal at hand. Well, That's what the give back is about for me. I mean, your story is just perseverance. If someone sent the elevator down, you chose not to take it, you went outside, climbed the cable, it popped, you held on, yeah and just climb the rest of the rope. I mean, it's just constant perseverance, and I know a lot of that came from and was shaped by your family life. 100%. And, um, and it, your mom's rock, and God bless her. And, uh, and how's Spoon doing? My dad, my dad is, uh, you know, the, the health is on the other side for him. He's, he's got his good days, he's got his bad days. But, you know, it's, uh, it's life. And me and my dad talk, and, you know, I want him to enjoy his time here at the highest level. So in our conversations, it's not about focusing on negative, it's about the positive. There's a lot to be happy about. Uh, you got grandbabies, you know, you still got two kids that are up and running and trying to do their best to, to be uh, the best versions of men that we can possibly be. And for that, he understands. Now my mom, my mom's a different ball game. That's my, that's my rock. My mom passed away. Uh, her birthday was actually on the 22nd. Happy birthday, Happy mom. Birthday. Rest in peace. Um, you know, the story about um, the Bible. Very true story. That is my, that's my favorite. Do you mind sharing no. that? No. Um, I was, I told my mom I wanted to pursue comedy full time. This is it. I made my choice. My mom was a professor at the University of Penn, so I could have went to UPenn free of charge. Um, I fucked that off. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's, not, it's not what I want. I want to do comedy. This is it. <laughs> And, you know, it didn't go well at first, but my mom was a good woman. She said, I'm going to support you. You got a year. You got a year to do it your way. If you don't do it your way, then you have to do it my way. Um, okay, you got a deal. And this time, you know, I'm struggling. I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, I'm trying to, trying to get money, trying to make my way. 
and it's not coming in. You know, it's very far few and in between. And I tell my mom, I'm like, look, I, I hate to come to you because I know we had a deal, but I need money for the rent. You know, they slapped a the notice on my door. They're, they're going to evict me. And my mom was like, did you read your Bible? And I was like, Mom, this isn't, this isn't time to read the Bible. Like, they're, they're, they're going to kick me out. Like, the colors of the notice are changing. I don't know what it means. But, but it seems like it's evolving to get the, get the fuck out. Like, it's, and, and she's like, you know, read your Bible. And I'm like, Mom, God, bye. I can't do this with you, Mom. I, I, I got to go. And days went by, and I called her again, and I was like, Mom, I'm serious. They're, they're really threatening to kick me out. She's like, read your Bible. She just wouldn't get off the Bible kick. And, you know, we, we went at it a little bit. And she was like, don't talk to me until you read your Bible. And there was one night where, you know, it's just all options are gone. And I'm in the house, and I go, let me just pick up this Bible and, and read the damn Bible. Let me, like, I'm so frustrated and I'm like, let me just do it so I can say I did it when I talk to her because I don't want to lie. And I open up the Bible, and the year's checks for my rent were all in the Bible. As soon as I opened it up, for every month, she put every month in right? my Bible. So she basically, for the time that I should have been reading my Bible, <laughs> <laughs> I, she figured out very fast that I wasn't. And, and the, lesson, the lesson that I, that I took from that, which goes back to my book, which is Life Lessons, is, you know, a person's faith in you sometimes is so powerful, you know, that you, you don't realize how important you are to this, to this thing, to the world. Like, my mom's faith in my vision to say, I'm not going to school, I want to do comedy, I don't know how, but this is it. To support that wholeheartedly and say, I want to set you up to win, that shows a different level of faith, that shows a different level of investment. Outside of being my parent, you're now investing into my dream. When I look at myself as a businessman, I look at myself as a CEO, the people that work for you invest in your dream. It goes hand in hand. You're investing in my vision. So I owe it to you to not only do what I say, but to go 110% for you because I don't want you to ever feel like you made the wrong choice of believing in me. I work so hard because I never want my mom to feel like she made the wrong choice by believing in me. So that's where the nonstop work ethic comes from. It comes from I got an angel over me that's looking at me, that's proud. I know she's proud, but I know that she would still be gone. I know that she would still say, what else? What are you doing next? So that's where the work ethic comes from. So that one little moment with my Bible is stuck in my damn head for life. <laughs> And I refuse to let it go. And I refuse to let my, my goal-oriented attitude fade. Shout I'm constantly out to Shout out to your mom. Speaking of all of the things that you're doing, I, I think we have a video. We want to talk a little about Laugh Out Loud. Okay. Right. So first, maybe let's watch this clip. Lucky me. This is cold as balls. Here we go. <laughs> hey, let me get a little bit of popcorn. Come on. See if I can get you extended a little bit. Out the top. Get out the top. Floyd Money Mayweather, baby. I know why you wear the number zero. Why? Because that's what your IQ is. <laughs> <laughs> you look very familiar, ma'am. Kevin Hart. What? You know, we need money. We can sell our eggs. You look like you look like your daddy too much. You look like after you, they do go back. 
today, I sit down with a fan of Beyonce. Please turn in your Bible to the Book of Formation. Brainstorming time, any and everything. We in a safe place. How come everybody can't use the M word? Yeah, I get the fuck out. Get in there! <laughs> Ma'am, what's your name? Treat. Uh, treat sound like a freak. I like that. Maybe like you need some dick. But like, no, I need some Motrin. Dick is what gave me the headache, but thank you. What play is that from? Julius and Little Caesar. Pizza, pizza. My man DJ Khaled. Leslie Jones. Conan O'Brien. Bill Hader. Khloe Kardashian. Chance the Rapper. We going beer yoga, guys! <laughs> this is quality material. Cut! <laughs> All right. So, Laugh Out Loud is a, a, a project you did with Lionsgate. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. You, you saw what's in the repertoire. You are working very closely with uh, Old Spice, Mountain Dew. So, there's an awful lot of brands in the audience. Yes, so yes, there are. So, what's it like to, you know, to work with Laugh Out Loud, and what are some of the opportunities looking forward? Uh, you know, first of all, this is, this is my baby. This is what I'm in love with right now. So, you know, the things that I was just talking about, where it's all about creating those opportunities and uh, giving a platform for this next generation. And some people of old to feel like they can go and, and succeed is the creative energy behind it. You know, uh, We're branding ourselves now as a platform that gives you comedy and color. And the reason why we felt like that was a good, uh, a good take on what we are is simply because I travel the world. You know, I travel the world doing stand-up comedy, and the one thing that I've realized is that the people that are coming to see me are of all colors. And comedy and color is universal. You know, people are colorful. Comedy can be colorful. Colorful is happy to me. When you say the word colorful, I get happy. Yeah. Um, and the relationships that we're now building on have been springboarded, of course, by me and my level of involvement, but they're getting bigger because they see I'm not just the guy that's putting on the CEO hat and stepping aside. I'm truly there doing the work. I've taken myself off of um, TV for a certain kind of content, you know, outside of my show on CBS, which is TKO. You won't see me on another TV show. You won't see me giving my likeliness there because I save it for here, you know, the talk show that we have, which is Cold as Balls, is doing bigger numbers. <laughs> I'm sorry about the name. Uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's doing bigger numbers than, you know, some of your prime time TV. Uh, you know, some of these interviews are ranging from five to 15 to 20 million views. Um, Lift Legend, these are things that have really popped because we embrace brands in a unique way. You know, the, the way that I love to partner is through authenticity. So if I can find ways to make your brand pop within a relationship, then I'm just as valuable to you as you are to me. I don't like things to look like a NASCAR effect. Like we're just taking on relationships just because. How can we find value in each other? So at Lyft, I said, the value in Lyft is me embracing your brand. So I will personally embrace it. It was me throwing on the makeup as Donald Mack and getting in these cars with people and giving surprise rides. With Old Spice, I said, I want to show how involved I am. So with Cold as Balls, let's bring you in, let's make you a part of it, and I'll embrace it with your other partners, your other athletes. I'll bring them on and give them a moment to talk about the product, and as they talk about the product, I incorporate it in an interview and make it look like conversation to where your marketing is a different level of marketing than what you may or may not have. I love marketing. I love finding unique ways to advertise in anything that I do, movies especially. I don't know if you guys saw, but I have a movie coming out uh, September 28th, 28th called Night School. And I just did a big thing in Times Square. And this will show you the type of partner I am. Um, I told Universal, I said, look, I want a double-decker bus. I want to be on the bus by myself. And I just want to ride around Times Square talking to people about the movie. I don't want to do anything else. For two hours, I'm just going to tell people why they should see the movie. And what you're going to get is people's shock reaction that I'm on a bus by myself and I'm spending all this time with a megahorn just talking about my movie. I'll shoot it, I'll cut it up, 
And the whole reason behind this whole sketch and the whole uh, stunt was for me to show the hard work and energy that I put into the things that I believe in. We got a thunderstorm, it started raining. They wanted to shut it down. I said, no, I'm in the rain with a megahorn, <laughs> yelling at people. It's only like three or four people on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Yelling at people, sir, can you please go see night school? I'm getting the craziest looks. I'm yelling at God. You don't want my movie to work. I'm, I'm, it ended up being the funniest piece of content because it was different. I took a billboard that was in Times Square. I climbed up on top of the billboard. I had them do a skyscraper scaffold machine and put me up there so I could sign Tiffany Haddish's face and tape $300 to her mouth because she tried to give me money back that I didn't want. These are ways to make promotion fun. It's ways to make marketing fun. I think in your world of advertising, there's a traditional way and there's an untraditional way. On Laugh Out Loud, we're about discovering the untraditional way. How do we find the new way to advertise? How do we find a way to spike you, spike your brand, and take you to a place that you may not have been before? How do I bring you instant gratification? How do I bring you a reward as soon as we hit the ground running? I only do that if you allow me to separate myself and if you allow me and my team to do what we think we do very best, and that's be creative. With the relationships that we have, Mountain Dew Kickstart, Old Spice, uh, Lyft, um, uh, who else am I missing, Jeff? Good job, Jeff. I can hear you. Thanks, man. <laughs> That's good. Tommy John, uh, who I'm also uh, an owner in as well. Uh, John Elliott, I'm an owner in that brand as well. I'm about to bring them over. We now have a relationship with Sirius XM. We have a channel, which is Laugh Out Loud, where I do a show called Straight From The Heart. But being that they gave me ownership of the channel, it's about branding that, the same way that I branded the network. So bringing other younger comedic talent to come on, host radio shows. Uh, right now, Earthquake has one of the shows. We're developing another one with a comedian called Rodney Perry, another one with David Arnold. Um, you know, Guy Tory. he also has a crew of people where they've been doing a podcast that's been successful. We're bringing them on board. It's, uh, it's just about putting so many things underneath this umbrella and having such a large variety of conversation about what's underneath the brand of Laugh Out Loud and how everything goes in a circle. So all of the things that are connected to me and to my brands make sense. Everything can promote and market the other. So when you sign up for this relationship, you're getting the Laugh Out Loud brand, the Sirius XM brand, and you're getting a piece of the Kevin Hart brand. And you also tap into Kevin Hart's social media as well because to launch anything, we go through me at first just to bring attention and eyeballs. But we don't oversaturate it to where it's too much, Kevin, and you get mad fast. We do it in a smart, unique way <laughs> to where my followers still feel like they're getting me and not just brands and advertising all the time. So it's a very smart approach to it. And I was just going to ask you why there is, why your particular um, brand of entertainment and storytelling is so great for partnerships, but I think you just nailed it, right? It's the authenticity that you bring. It's the intimate connection that you have with your brands, with your fans. Mm -hmm. So when you bring on partners, it feels very organic. Well, it has to, I, I can't say this enough, guys. Like it, I've turned down so much money. I've turned down so much money for things that just don't make sense. Um, the Mountain Dew Kickstart deal. The only reason why that deal ended up making sense because I said, I don't want this to affect my health and wellness side, okay? I said, I, I stand as an ambassador for Nike that happened in such a crazy way that a comedian is signed by an athletic brand. The reason why I was able to do that is because I make the person that doesn't consider themselves to be an athlete feel like an athlete. So the consumer that Nike doesn't go after, I bring to you. I bring you the person that's sitting on the couch that has no idea what dry fit is or was. I bring you the person that sits on the couch that doesn't know why they need running sneakers versus training sneakers. Because I'm giving them a different level of messaging. I'm giving them a different level of go get it. I'm not a runner. I started off doing a mile, and then it went to three miles, then the 10 Ks, then now half marathons, now full marathons. And my reason for doing it is because I put a purpose behind my run. I've changed that, and I said, you know what? 
I can now put the bigger purpose behind my run, and now that's how I'm going to send kids to school. So I raised money from running my marathon to take the money and then send kids to college. I made myself and other friends match the money I put up, so I had a good number. Went and found me a good partner that can match that number, and we sent 18 kids. I think it was like $650,000, right? So the, the point that I'm making is that those things went together. I told Mountain Dew, I want to be in business with you, but we have to find a unique way for that business to exist to where I don't affect the things that are already under my brand. I'm on tour. My irresponsible tour is what I do. There's so much that has to go into it because I travel. I'm gone constantly. I'm nonstop from the company to laugh out loud, to heartbeat, and then I still got to do a show on the weekend. Your drink is about having a boost. Base it around me as a comedian and make it about me and me needing a boost before I get on stage. That's not to merge into health and wellness. That's not to merge into energy because now we found a unique word. Together we did this. This wasn't them bringing it to me. This was me sitting in a room with them because my brand is at stake. So if you don't do it right and you're just coming up and I'm the work for hire that's not a partner, then that means the business that we share together isn't a real business because it's one-sided. But when you see that I'm just as engaged as you are, and you see that I'm just as adamant as you are about finding the right language, the right wording, then you know that I'm just as adamant about making your product pop. My campaign with Mountain Dew Kickstart was the biggest campaign that they've ever had. My Move With Heart campaign with Nike was one of the biggest campaigns that they've ever had. Anything that I've touched from a campaign perspective, my Super Bowl commercial, when I did the one car commercial, outside of one that I did years ago that I shouldn't have because I didn't know any better. It became the biggest Super Bowl commercial ever. And I've yet to attach myself to another brand, especially when it comes to cars. Because if I do anything when it comes to cars, I want it to be family related. That's the one thing that I haven't been able to tie in to my brand. And I would love something. I don't care if it's a minivan, a mini Cooper, something that says Kevin Hart gets in this and this is how he and his family get around when they're not doing work. Lee when, Nadler, report to the stage. Listen, <laughs> Lee Nadler. This is the one thing that I've stayed away from because all things that have come have just been based around Kevin Hart. Another thing that I've stayed away from because nothing's come that makes it make sense. I would love a deal with something that takes pictures, photo moments. Why? Because that's what I do. That goes with my career. That goes with my everyday movement. Nothing that I'm talking about from a relationship standpoint, makes you go, why is Kevin with that? If I have any type of camera endorsement, why would I want it? Because I need to catch the moments that I feel like are the biggest in my life. You got a guy that's making history and breaking ground on a daily basis. Those are photo op moments. You got a guy that constantly takes pictures of his kids all day, every day. Those are photo op moments. You got a guy that's now the most happily married guy in the world because he's so real about his ups and downs that now the space that he's in, you believe it and you watch it from a space of I respect it. So anything that I do comes around full circle. A brand can never question why they're in business with me. You can't because you get it. You get me you get what I want instantly, and you get what I'm willing to give. So I know that there are a lot of advertisers here. I know that you guys are looking to do smart business. I know that you guys are looking for partnerships that make sense, not just for the entertainer or the business, but for you. I make sense for you because I get you. It's not one-sided. I understand what you can put up, and I understand what I can give back. So with that being said, there's an amazing opportunity for all of us at some point in time to have conversations and figure things out because I would like to hear from you just like you're hearing from me. And I know that right now, that Laugh Out Loud network that you guys just looked at and saw, if you look at this space, things are dropping like flies. They're starting and, and, and they're dropping. So many of these platforms are not surviving because they're doing it and, and doing it incorrectly. Some are throwing all the money in the world at it. Some of it are not throwing enough at it. How have I somehow maintained? How have we somehow stayed in a great space to where our numbers are growing, we have a great following, we have a great quality look behind us, and I have a great partner in Lionsgate. 
It's because we're being strategic and we're being patient because we know that's the way to win. This will be a big company. It will be. Not because I'm, I'm, I'm praying on it, because I know. I know the people that we have that are working within that umbrella that are giving it 110%. And I know the partners that are stepping up to the plate that see the vision and that believe in it. So if anything, if you see me, you see my level of success, it's a lot of hard work that goes into it. Same, same amount of hard work is going into that. That's the one thing I want you to take away from that. If nothing else, I bust my ass for a reason. I'm not doing it to lose. I'm doing it to win big. <laughs> so if I don't win big, then that means I've wasted years of my life. I've yet to lose. I don't see it happening. I don't, I don't lose. I don't I see it happening. Happen. I don't. You, uh, you really haven't made a lot of wrong bets yet. Um, some starts and stops in the beginning, but basically, I mean, you've been on a, on a lightning trajectory. I just want to make sure we're okay on time. We're going to wrap it up. Um, but that's a good place to leave it. That was a great segue, by the way. Yeah, that was awesome, right? <laughs> See how I did that? Um, <laughs> Kevin, thank you for being here. You're very, he's on tour right now. He, he found 45 minutes to sit here with us. We're so appreciative. Uh, Night School, September 28th. Make sure you go see it. Make sure you pick up his book. Make sure you read that. Make sure you laugh out loud. And if any of you want to get in touch with him, let me know. I'll put you directly in touch with his management. Please. Another, Mr. Oh, another thing I'll wait. say before, uh, before we get out of here. This is tape on my neck. So if y'all can see it, don't, don't think I'm sick. I just felt this. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't, know, how, I don't know what it it's, looks it's, like. It's surgical. We, you okay. know, we it? wiped it down. Okay. Yeah, no, I, just did, I just felt it. I was like, hey, okay. I don't want y'all to think I did something crazy. This is <laughs> it's just tape. Um, I would also tell you guys this, okay? Um, the other thing that I'm now learning and that I'm now understanding is um, within my tour, not only would I reach, but the opportunities that I've been able to uh, make happen on a global level. I want you guys to also understand that you're dealing with a real global talent. You know, the years of the comic not transferring worldwide is, is over. And I'm proof of that, especially the the black comic, you know, at one point in time, you know, movies with a black lead in it weren't being sold internationally. It didn't do good numbers. You know, I've quietly, I've quietly broken that stereotype and have just constantly worked in doing it and not made a lot of noise. The reason why is because in my stand-up side, I've been going back to these places year after year. I just left the global part of my tour, my European tour, uh, and we went everywhere, you know, from Berlin to uh, Norway to Iceland, uh, Scandinavia, the UK, um, uh, God, Dublin. Um, it's arena tour. I mean, Football. no, it's a, arenas, like yeah. really big numbers. And in the European portion alone, we probably did about, I would say, 175,000 to 250,000 people. In London alone, we did about 80,000 people. These arenas are 10 to 15,000 seat arenas. What I've been able to do now is present my, my network on a global level. This tour, this tour now ends probably in February. Within my production company, I've now figured out how to create content that I can produce that I can also filter to my network that stuff that I produce and filter, some of the things can be lagged and delayed until my next tour comes up. And when that next tour comes up, I figure out a way to, to incorporate it in my pre-tour show, another word, pre-show. So before I hit the stage, there's a big ass monitor, big video, and you get a dose of Kevin Hart. So when I decide to turn on a different business for this platform, I'm taking it on a global level and I'm self-promoting it. I'm basically on tour, not just with myself as a comedian, but I'm on tour with the brand that I'm now invested in. So every place that I go, the booths that I can set up outside, the meet and greets that I can set up outside, the information, the tablets, the greeters that I can have, I can literally put on a complete, a completely different show before the actual show. 
VIP rooms are set up that people can come to and discover and learn more about the Laugh Out Loud network before you go see the talent that you came to see. I'm able to do so much because I control the entity. I own my tours. So you're dealing with a real CEO that can make CEO decisions that can make different deals for you along the same lines with my network, within my partners. There's layers to me. So understand there's layers to my business as well. So just keep that in mind. You guys have heard a lot. You've heard a lot of passion. You've heard a lot of authenticity. And I don't bullshit. What I say is real, okay? So I'm leaving, but guys, I wouldn't be happy if I didn't leave here and gain great relationships from this. I'm here for a reason. And I'm here because I'm not only a fan of the event, I'm a fan of what you guys do, and I know the value in a relationship with you. So I'm hoping that we can figure out business, and I'm hoping that we can figure out ways to make each other great, because that's what I'm here for, and that's what I'm adamant about. So please take advantage of me. Please. Okay? Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, man.